Today on the Matt Wall Show, protesters swarmed outside my speech on a college campus last night, screaming that my presence threatens their very existence. I want to talk about that claim today and what they really mean by it. Also, Tucker Carlson interviews Kanye West. Joe Biden releases from prison anyone convicted of simple marijuana possession, which is to say he released no one from prison. The media is perplexed that Republican voters in Georgia aren't abandoning Herschel Walker following the media's smear campaign. In our daily cancellation, we will deal with McDonald's latest promotion the adult Happy Meal, all of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. So yesterday was the second stop in my What is a Woman college tour. This was a week that began 46 years ago, it feels like, with three major medical associations writing to the DOJ and calling for my arrest and the arrest of the other uh, high-profile, quote-unquote, conservatives who criticize them. A day later, Media Matters launches their smear campaign, exposing the long-suppressed fact that I was once 23 years old. And finally, yesterday, um, I screened the film and spoke at University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, and protesters swarmed outside the auditorium, doing their best unsuccessfully to disrupt and kind of drown me out. Um, frankly, the events of this week are, are they're, they're making me start to suspect that there are some people in this country who really don't like me. And I still can't imagine why that would be the case. I'm such a lovable guy. But the protesters last night were, uh, were vastly outnumbered by supporters, by uh, people who support. When I say supporters, I mean supporter, people who support, uh, you know, objective truth and rationality. Um, we filled the room to its capacity of three, 350, 350 people, and we had to turn 400 more people away. It wasn't all that long ago that I was giving college speeches to crowds of like 40 or 50. So this has been an interesting change of pace. And as mentioned, protesters were uh, kept outside the auditorium, but were allowed to remain in the hallway for some reason. I'm told they made a few attempts to get inside the room, and when that was not successful... They settled for chanting and sometimes even singing right outside the door. And unfortunately for the rest of us, they chose a song to sing that requires them to hit notes very much outside their vocal range. Listen. Easy go, little high, little low, and the wind blows, does it really matter to me? I was interested to see that video after the event because I, I heard some of that noise while I was giving the speech, and uh, I, I didn't know that they were attempting to sing. Actually, it sounded to me like somebody was drowning a bag of cats in the hallway, and I, you know, I was concerned about that. Um, and I'm relieved to find out that no animals were hurt, even if we cannot say the same for our eardrums. When it was time to leave, protesters came around to the exit to you know, flip me off and cuss me out and uh, presenting a, a compelling argument, ultimately unpersuasive, though, I think. As we were getting ready to drive away, they came over to the car uh, to chant some more. Here's what that looked like. You know, maybe they're right. Trans rights are human rights. I didn't believe it the first 600 times it was chanted, but the 601st time really sank in. Almost, anyway. I think I need to hear it maybe another 600 times before I decide. But there's there's one short clip from last night, uh, a couple of short clips, actually, that I think are worth more serious reflection. So going back inside, while my speech was still ongoing, Somebody with the school, I think this is somebody with the school, made uh, an attempt to quiet the protesters down. Now, it would have been easiest to just kick them out of the building as they don't actually have any right to gather inside the building with the express intent of disrupting an event. But 
they were allowed to anyway remain there, um, even though it's actually against the campus rules to you know, be disruptive like that inside the building. Campus decided not to fully enforce their rules. Feeble attempts were made to reason with them. But I want you to listen to this exchange. Here it is. It is still disruptive to the speaker inside and the audience inside. We would protect the event similarly. How does this help? Okay, well, him being here is disruptive to the IBA as a whole. This is dangerous. It encourages violence. So she says, him being here is disruptive to my being as a whole. And someone else off camera who's crying says that uh, I encourage violence and so I'm dangerous. And they continued with this line. Listen. Well, his documentary is disruptive to the trans community and their being as a whole. And him being here makes a large group of the people on this campus that makes this campus what it is feel unsafe. We don't feel protected. We don't feel appreciated. And it's disgusting and disheartening. So that's why we're here and that's why we're going to stand here. I understand. You would be welcome to stand here. I would hear the disruption. Right. So there it is again. My presence is disruptive to her being and the being of every trans person. And it makes a large portion of the student body feel unsafe. Now, um, uh, I know that we're accustomed to hearing this kind of thing from the left. But the mistake we make is to assume that they're just sort of putting on an act. That this is all, uh, you know, playing it up for the, for the cameras. I don't believe that they are. I think this is truly what they think. It's what they believe. We know that college students especially believe it because they've been conditioned into this belief system from birth. And so when they say it's disruptive to my being, it puts me at danger and danger, it's a threat. uh, They really believe that. That's what they actually think. That's why they're there. Now, as far as they're concerned, their very being is is threatened by my ideas and my presence. And not just my presence and my ideas, but the ideas shared by many of the people in the room. But but listen to the phrasing there. Because she's not just saying that her life is threatened. But instead she's saying that her being is threatened. And she's right in a certain sense. Now, I am not threatening her physical existence in the slightest. Nobody in the room was threatening her physical existence in the slightest. But what she really means is that her conception of her own existence, her perception of herself and of reality, her self-identity are uh, destabilized, are thrown into disarray when they come within physical proximity of somebody who will not affirm them. And this is a terrifying thing for her and, and for me too, but for a different reason. Okay, here's why I find it terrifying. I find it terrifying That we are populating society with people who are this fragile, this helpless and dependent. People who cannot function, who are reduced to tears and paralysis if their internal conception of reality is contradicted in the slightest way by anyone anywhere. What is terrifying is not the prospect that these people will uh, get out into the real world and encounter harsh reality and just fall apart. No, that, that would be a good thing. I, I, I wish that that would happen for, for the sake of society and for their own sake. That they need to fall apart. They need to be intellectually and emotionally unmade so that a mature and rational person can rise from the rubble. This is, in many ways, the process of growing up. But no, the, the, ter- the terrifying truth is that such a collapse will not happen, most likely. They will never encounter the real world because the real world in our culture at least, has reordered itself to protect and foster the delusions of the most fragile among us. This is unsustainable, of course. And what it means is that in order to stop them from collapsing personally, society will have to collapse instead. It'll collapse because it simply cannot carry the weight of all of these false ideas and false assumptions. The burden is too heavy too cumbersome. This is the outcome of raising generations of people who believe that it is the responsibility of every stranger they come across on the street to affirm their own self-understanding. You know, they say, this is what I want to believe about myself and about the world. 
and you must tell me that it is true or else you are a threat to my existence and to my being. That's what you really meant. And that's why they were gathered with their signs in the hallway. That's even why they were singing Bohemian Rhapsody, oddly enough. And that's why we must oppose them, no matter what. Now let's get to our five headlines. Kanye West was interviewed by Tucker Carlson yesterday. It was a wide-ranging, interesting interview. Worth watching the whole thing if you haven't seen it. At one point, he addresses the controversy over his White Lives Matter shirt that he wore with uh, Candace Owens a few days ago. And let's watch that. So you said um, that your father said when he saw the shirt, White Lives Matter, it's great to see a black man stating the obvious. So by which I think you meant that's obviously true. Yeah, that my favorite response, because I kept on thinking like, you know, people, they're looking for an explanation. And people say, well, as an artist, you don't have to give an explanation. But as a leader, you do. Yes, I think that's right. So the answer to why I wrote White Lives Matter on a shirt is because they do. It's the obvious thing. Seems like a simple enough answer. I mean, I don't know. Um, and and one, it's it's not only simple, but it's a it's one that no critic has ever been able to respond to. So we know there are a lot of criticisms of saying white lives matter, certainly wearing it on a t shirt, but they've never been able, been able to actually explain the criticism or what their problem is with it. Um, if white lives matter, why can't we say so? Why shouldn't we say so? How could it ever, ever, under any circumstance, be a bad idea to affirm the value and dignity of human life, of any human life? And you can't claim, see, the critics, they can't claim that uh, saying white lives matter means that black lives don't matter. They can't claim that because they're the ones who've claimed before that saying black lives matter doesn't mean that white lives don't matter. I mean, that's that's one of their criticisms of White Lives Matter is that it's not necessary to say because when someone says Black Lives Matter, they're not they're not trying to say that, that white lives don't. Well, if that's the case, then there's no reason not to say White Lives Matter because the same's in the reverse. Because you're saying White Lives Matter doesn't mean Black Lives don't. I mean, we can we can probably assume that Candace Owens and Kanye West don't believe that Black Lives Matter that Black Lives don't matter, given that they're both. Black, and I would think that they probably find that their own lives are, are valuable. So the only way to understand the criticism is that the critics apparently think that, that any time you're affirming the value of life, of lives, it should be black lives. So what they're saying is, you know, why are you saying white lives matter when you could be saying black lives matter? So if, if you're going to be, if you're going to go out there declaring that lives matter, then uh, if you're doing that, then then it's, you're wasting time by saying white lives. You should be saying black lives matter instead, which which doesn't make any sense, especially when um, there's there's no shortage of people who are out declaring that black lives matter. So you'd think it'd be okay every once in a while for someone to say, hey, you know what? By the way, uh, white lives matter too. Now, what's really underneath all this, as we talked about a few days ago, I mean, the, the, the reality is like, the, the only reason to oppose someone even saying that is if you disagree with it. But the critics aren't going to say that. They're, they're not quite at the point. Now, you can, get away with, you can get away with a lot of anti-white racism in our culture. You can, get away, you can get away with quite a lot of it. But we're probably not yet at the point where it'll be socially acceptable to just go out and directly say white lives don't matter at all. They're all a bunch of scumbags and should die. You can get pretty close to that. But the critic, but the people who feel that way certainly certainly seem to think that they can't go all the way and actually declare that. And so, you know, they, they won't say. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, come up with reasons why you shouldn't say white lives matter. But uh, we all know that the real reason, the real reason they feel that is that, is that to them it's just not true. Speaking of lives mattering, uh, Kanye also explained his pro-life stance, which I thought was interesting. Here's that. You just landed, and you have a lanyard still on from it, and there's a photograph on it. What is that? It's a photograph of a baby's ultrasound. Why is that? And that you designed that? Yes. Why? What does that mean? 
Uh, it just represents life. I'm pro-life. Boy, so you wear it on a badge. What, what kind of response do you get? And, and good, amen, I agree. I don't care about people's responses. I care about the fact that there's more black babies being aborted than born in New York City at this point. That 50% of black death in America is abortion. So I really don't care about people's responses. I perform for an audience of one, and that's God. Amen, as Tug Carlson said. And uh, that's another point that is really impossible for the left to respond to. So they just they just sort of ignore it, and um, and they they get around it by, as they often do, by just declaring the opposite. So they 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 take the the opposite position entirely. Um, even though it doesn't make any sense. And um, instead, they'll say that, no, actually, it's uh, it's racist, it's anti-black to be pro-life. You know, pro-life people are actually racist. Along with being anti-woman and all the rest of it, that they're, well, let's throw it all in. And somehow it's homophobic, too, and everything to be, to be pro-life. But it's also anti-black. Just like they can't explain their criticism of the White Lives Matter t-shirt, they also can't explain that. Especially when, as Kanye West points out, you know, if the pro-lifers have their way, if we have our way, if we really had our way, and there was no more abortion across the entire country, it all it all went away, and uh, Planned Parenthood was was thrown on the historical ash heap, and that was it. That would mean that a lot that that many more black children would be born. And that the black population in America would increase substantially, not just in numbers. Now, all populations would increase in numbers, white, black, all populations, if you get rid of abortion, because all races are having abortions. But more than that, black population would increase substantially in numbers, but also in, in, as a matter of percentage. Because right now, um, you know, the, the black community accounts for a vastly disproportionate number of abortions. And so the gains percentage wise would be would be disproportionate as well. So that's what if you're pro life. That's part of what you're fighting for. Meanwhile, on the left, they are fighting to kill more black people and to keep them, you know, to keep their sort of percentages lower. That's what that's what they're doing. But that is the pro black anti racist position. They say. In this upside down world of ours. Since we're on the subject of Black Lives Matter, now's a good time, by the way, to tell you about the premiere of the new Candace Owens documentary, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold, which premieres uh, finally on October 12th. And this was uh, going to come out way back in May, you may remember, but Candace decided she wanted to do even more with it, even an even deeper dive. And that's what they've been doing over the past several months. And it was uh, worth the wait, I can tell you. Candace is going to expose the sham BLM organization and all the false narratives it has driven and that it has thrived on. But you can't watch it unless you are a Daily Wire Plus member. Uh, it, look, it's, it's just true. It's a, it's a true statement that, and yes, I am biased, but it's also true that nobody is making content like this. Nobody else is. I would, I would challenge you to come up with a, another company, someone else, Someone somewhere else in the conservative world that's making content like this. This documentary could not exist on any other platform. It's like, what is a woman? It's something that needs to exist, uh, content that needs to be made, but nobody's making it but us. And that's why we need you on board as a subscriber, helping us in, in the fight. There, there's a reason why when the left is you know really going hard at a conservative media figure, trying to take them down, it's almost always you notice Someone here at the Daily Wire, Candace, Ben, me. I mean, there's always like some conservative trending every week. Some conservative in, in media is like a main character on Twitter every week, but but never for a good reasons because they're trying to take us out. And it's almost always someone here at the Daily Wire, um, or you know, there are a few outside, like Tucker Carlson's another one, obviously. But they're very worried about us and about what we're doing because we're in this fight. We're fighting to win. We are serious about it. This is not just publicity. This is not just content marketing for us. We're putting it on the line. And uh, we can we can do that only because we have the support of our subscribers. We couldn't do it without you. With you, we can. 
and we can win the fight together. So this is a great time to become a member of uh, The Daily Wire. If you haven't, you can, you can do that now before October 12th, which is the big premiere event. And um, there's about to be another Daily Wire documentary that catches the world by, by storm. And you'll see it for yourself if you become a member. So I would urge you to do that. All right, Politico has this. This is their headline. And uh, they're very upset. They say, Walker's, Her- this is Herschel Walker, Her- Herschel Walker's Christian fans are unfazed by abortion revelations. And it goes into it. It says, Pastor Anthony George didn't set out to be a defender of Herschel Walker. But as the prominent Baptist minister welcomed Walker into his church this week for a scheduled prayer event with faith leaders, George found himself making the Christian case for supporting a candidate whose Senate campaign has been marred by personal scandal. What matters most, he said, is what Walker is promising to do once he's elected. Quote, I think that any Christian who engages in the political process, and especially someone who's a pastor, you're always going to be confronted with someone that is either less than ideal or something that flat out contradicts what you believe in. He said in an interview, since revelation surfaced that the former football star and self-described pro-life Republican had allegedly paid for an ex-girlfriend's abortion in 2009, evangelical Christian leaders in Georgia have banded together to support Walker, as has the Republican Party in general. Walker has staked out a hard line, uh, no exceptions position on abortion. Walker's 13-month campaign has been punctuated by blemishes on his record of traditional family values, including allegations of domestic abuse and fathering children out of wedlock. Those revelations continued late Wednesday with a report from the Daily Beast alleging that the woman whose abortion he paid for is also the mother of one of his children. So far, Christian evangelical leaders have not flagged in their support, saying that he aligns with them on key policy matters. All right. So the media is uh, acting perplexed by this, as they always do. They put out this hit piece about Herschel Walker claiming he paid for an abortion years ago. And this is on the heels of other hit pieces as, as they just summarize their claiming domestic abuse and all these terrible things. As always, the media expects that this will immediately make the support for this person evaporate. But in this case, as has usually been the case in recent years, that hasn't worked out for them. And every single time, you know, in politics, there's a, a candidate, and they're trying to take the candidate out. They put a bunch of hit pieces, and, and uh, I mean, Trump is the classic example of this, but certainly not the only example. They put out the hit pieces. They say, look, this person's terrible. Look at these allegations we found. And recently, anyway, the response from conservatives and from people in the base is just to sort of yawn and ignore it. And the media, they, they, they can't take it. They're so, it makes them feel helpless and powerless and they get very frustrated because they say, what, what do you mean? We told you this person's terrible. You're not supposed to, we told you you're not supposed to support this person. Why would you still be doing it when we told you otherwise? Well, let me see if I can try to explain it for them. So there are two things for this. If I could, and I'm not a, I'm not a, a voter in Georgia, but if I were to, if I could, to, if I would dare to speak for them, Let me me tell you what the thought process probably is. I'm not just speaking for them. I mean, I've listened to the voters in in Georgia, and this is what they seem to be saying. So there's two things. Number one, to begin with, there's no reason to believe an allegation just because it came from the media. I mean, it could be true. So the claim that Herschel Walker paid for an abortion could be true. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the guy. I know very little about him, actually, other than he's a, I know about his athletic career and a little bit about his uh, political policy positions, but I certainly don't, don't know him personally. Don't know a lot about his uh, background and biography. So, I mean, it could be true. It could also not be true. And the, the uh, possibility that this is a fabrication or something, that this is a a, a fabricated media hit piece, like you can never take that off the table. You can never discount that possibility. And so that's the first problem you have. If you're in the media that's and you're wondering why it's not resonating, that's the first reason is that people hear that and, and you know, maybe they, that someone tells them, oh, did you hear this claim about Herschel Walker? And then, and then they go, well, wait, wait, how, how do we know that? Oh, oh it was out on, uh, you know, CNN said it. And then the other person's got to say, oh, CNN said it? Well, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Now, you might not like that if you're in media, but this, this, you've done this to yourself. There are consequences for your actions. And when you've proven yourself to be dishonest time and time again, when you've proven yourselves to be political vultures, 
uh, obviously hyper-partisan, this is how people respond to you. That's the first thing. And then, and, then, and then there's also the second thing, which is that even if it's true, okay, let's just let, we'll say for a second that it's, it's true that, he's, that he paid for an abortion. Terrible, terrible thing. Awful. An awful moral crime. And uh, should be like a, 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 an actual crime. Although at the time when this allegedly happened, it wasn't. So no question about it. But in Georgia, you're left with, the voters are left with two choices. They've got Herschel Walker, who supports, who supports pro-life policies. And they've got uh, Warnock, who, support, who openly supports rabidly pro-abortion policies. I mean, he believes in abortion up until the moment of birth. Maybe even after, who knows. So those are the two options. And the voters in Georgia aren't stupid. They, they understand that those are the options. And so on one hand, you have someone who supports pro-life policies and all indications are that he would support, and especially if, he, if he's voted into office on that platform, he's not going to suddenly change and say, yep, just kidding, gotcha, I'm actually pro-abortion. He's not going to do that. He's going to continue to support those policies. And that is going to save lives. While on the other hand, you have someone who has professed that he wants to kill more babies. That's his intention. Um. Those are your two choices. It just, it's, there's, there's, it's not even a choice. There's not even really anything to think about. I mean, even if it were true that Herschel Walker not only paid for an abortion, a terrible sin. Well, let's just say that, that, that even right now in his head, he's still pro-abortion. Again, I don't know that to be true at all. But let's, let's say it is. This is all a, a put on. He's faking it. Well, even so. You elect him as, a, as someone who supports pro-life policies. That's what he'll do in office. And the effect, no matter what he feels inside his head, no matter what he's done in his past, the effect going forward in the future is that it's going to protect babies. He might be protecting them while in his head, he might be, he might be doing it begrudgingly. He might in his head be wishing that the more babies were being killed. I mean... But in reality, the actual effect in, re- in, real, in the real world is that, is that this is going to protect babies. Whereas this other guy over here is openly saying, let's kill him. I want to kill more. So that's it. That's, uh, that's the, the, the choices. So as a, if you're a Christian, if you're a pro-life voter in Georgia, you're looking at these two uh, choices. You're obviously not going to say, well, I don't, you know, Herschel Walker, he might have paid for an abortion. So I'm not going to vote for him because I'm opposed to abortion. Instead, I'm going to vote for the openly pro-abortion guy. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but you're also probably not going to say, well, uh, this guy's openly pro-abortion. The other guy may have paid for an abortion, which is a terrible thing. And I'm very anti-abortion, so I'm just going to stay home. And the effect is that the, the openly pro-abortion guy will win. You're also not going to do that. Because you want, you want to do the thing that's going to help advance pro-life policies and the pro-life cause politically. All right. Joe Biden tweeted this, if I could pull it up. Um, as we head into the midterms, you know, look, Joe Biden, it's uh, not a good situation for the Democrats. Everything that they touch turns to, everything that Joe Biden touches in particular, turns to garbage so it's, it's very much, the, he's like the anti-Midas. It's like the opposite of the Midas touch. And he's looking for something popular, something easy as we go into the midterms. And uh, this is what he finds. He tweeted, as I've said before, no one should be in jail just for using or possessing marijuana. Today, I'm taking steps to end our failed approach. Allow me to lay them out. First, I'm pardoning all prior federal offenses of simple marijuana possession. There are thousands of people who are previously convicted of simple possession who may be denied employment, housing, or educational opportunities. As a result, my pardon will remove this burden. Second, I'm calling on governors to pardon simple state marijuana possession offenses, just as no one should be in a federal prison solely for possessing marijuana. No one should be in a local jail or state prison for that reason either. Third, we classify marijuana at the same level as heroin and more serious than fentanyl. It makes no sense. I'm asking uh, Secretary Becerra and the Attorney General to initiate the process of reviewing how marijuana is scheduled under federal law. Well, that's, that's a pretty firm step right there. That's a productive step. I am asking 
these two other bureaucrats to initiate the process of reviewing how marijuana is scheduled under federal law. I just, I love that. Classic, classic political move of uh, making a big announcement and like you're not doing anything at all. I, to this, I right now am going to initiate the process of assembling a committee to discuss how we can review in the future this policy and how it might affect. And Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd also like to note that as a federal and state regulations change, we still need important limitations on trafficking, marketing, and underage sales of marijuana. Sending people to jail for possessing marijuana has upended too many lives for conduct that is legal in many states. That's before you address the clear racial disparities around prosecution and conviction. Today, we begin to right these wrongs. Well, no, today you begin to do nothing at all, so just more of the same. Uh, that's a big nothing. Initiating the process of reviewing is nothing. But even more than that, pardoning people who are in federal prison for simple marijuana possession. You know, when you, when you, when you do that, do you know how many people are going to actually be free now? Now that this pardon has been issued all across the country, how many people this morning are emerging from their jail cells into the sunlight, blurry eyed, free again? How many? I can tell you what the answer is. Zero. None. None, no people. There, there, there are currently, b- right before the pardon and now, no one, no people in federal prison for simple marijuana possession. None, zero, none at all. That's just, it's not a thing, okay? The, the, the proponents of criminal justice reform have tried to pretend that this is a thing and it's not. Sending people to, to federal prison because they were caught with like a little bit of weed in their pocket. It's just not happening. Period. I think there have been, at least what the media is telling us, is there have been something like 6,000, uh, maybe 6,500 people charged with uh, simple marijuana possession on the federal level in the last 30 years. And those are just charges. How many of them actually went to, spent time in federal prison? Almost none of them. And those are also charges. How do those charges come about? Well, you have to figure a certain portion of them. It was the charges that they originally had were were, uh, pleaded down. And uh, also, another point. Simple marijuana possession is a misdemeanor anyway. And having a misdemeanor is not going to stop anyone from getting a house. Who is being prevented from owning a house because of a misdemeanor? It's probably not going to stop you from getting a job. It's not going to stop you from doing anything. It's a misdemeanor. That's the whole point. That's why we, that's why we have that category in the criminal justice system. It's, it's going to have very little impact on your life. So this is, it was only ever a slap on the wrist for simple marijuana possession. That's all it ever was. And that's all it will be now. So this does nothing at all. What's the real point? Well, the real point is obviously about virtue signaling, and uh, what is the virtue being signaled in this case? The virtue being signaled is the virtue of being soft on crime? And I'm not saying that I think that people should be going to federal prison for simple marijuana possession. I don't think that, but it's not happening. So it's, it's not an issue. I also don't think, but, but you know, decriminalizing and legalizing all across the country, I also don't think that's the solution, as we've talked about recently. Uh, there was a time when I kind of bought into that argument, but I, I can look around. I mean, we, we, we can see how it's worked out because as Joe Biden observes, um, the laws have already been changed in many states and many cities where uh, marijuana is either legalized or decriminalized and people can walk around smoking weed till their heart's content. And has it helped anything? No, the, the, the drug abuse problem in our cities is only getting worse over time, not better. So that's all, that's all that this is. It's just a, it's a big nothing. And, and yet I see there's even some people kind of on the right, or at least people who are not full-on leftists. I mean, Elon Musk was one that responded to this. He didn't say a lot. He just responded with a thumbs-up emoji. So it wasn't, a huge, it wasn't like a, a huge celebration. But you know, there are plenty of people who are not leftists who are responding to this. And say, oh, I, this is a good, this is the right move. I support this. Now, doing something just for show that has no other effect, that's, that's not something that we should 
line up to applaud. All right. What else we got? All right. Here's a little bit of uh, celebrity gossip. Giselle Bündchen and Tom Brady are taking two wildly different routes. This is from Fox News, by the way. Wildly different routes when it comes to protecting their peace as they battle marital differences that could ultimately lead to divorce after 13 years of marriage. 42-year-old supermodel was spotted leaving a holistic healer's office in Miami on Friday. Her appointment didn't end inside the building, though, as the naturopath reportedly brought a smudge stick and burned sage around Punchin's vehicle before she drove off. I don't even know what any of those words mean. A Well, sage I know, but a naturopath. The hell is that? Brought a smudge stick and burned sage around her vehicle. So she's getting divorced and, uh, you know, they're giving up on their marriage. And her solution to make everything okay is to burn, to have a naturopath, like a witch doctor, come and circle her vehicle with sage. That's going to make it okay. It's going to make it okay for the kids, right? The kids, don't worry. uh, Dad and I are are getting divorced. We're breaking the family apart. But uh, don't worry. We're going to have a lot of appointments with the holistic healer, and he's going to be burning a lot of sage, and we're going to get through this together, okay? Um, It continues, burning sage is a centuries-old ritual from indigenous people that has been known for spiritually cleansing a person or space. Well, no, it hasn't been known for that. It's, I mean, it maybe has been claimed that it's done that, but it just literally does nothing at all. It's it's, it's, it's like pardoning people for simple uh, marijuana possession. It's just uh, symbolic, if anything. Uh, Bunchin's alternative lifestyle includes clean living, wellness routines, meditation, eating only homegrown or organic food, and getting divorces. I added the second one on. While Bunchin cleared her energy, Brady reportedly is tackling his own emotions regarding their fumbling relationship, as a source told People that uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback feels very hurt by her amid claims that they both retained divorce attorney. It's pretty obvious that he's hurting, a source told the publication. She's the one steering the divorce. She's playing offense, and he's playing defense. He wants to protect himself, protect his interests, but he's only starting to go the legal route in his defense from her. He just wants to be, he doesn't want this to be ugly. He doesn't want to fight. If the divorce is happening, he wants it to go as smoothly as possible. Well, you know, a non-ugly divorce, first of all, is a myth. It's, it's, it's actually impossible. I mean, there, there are, deg- there are degrad- uh, uh, gradations, or what I'm looking for. Degradation also is an appropriate word, but there are gradations of ugliness when it comes to divorce. Some are uglier than others, but they're all ugly. It's an ugly thing. It's an ugly thing. You're dissolving a marriage. There's, there, there's no beautiful way to do it. There's no really peaceful or holistic, holistically healing way to do it. And it's a sad story. It's, it's always very sad when I read stories like this. Not because they're celebrities. You know, that doesn't matter. But because they've been married for a long time and they have kids. And so anytime I read a story, I hear about something like this. I, I, it's, it's, I find it very sad. Um, and I would hope, that, I don't know anything about their situation other than what you read in the, in the in the news, but I would hope that Tom Brady's fighting for his marriage, you know, fighting for his family. And this is, in a certain way, it's kind of a tale as, as old as time, at least based on the reports about this. Tale as old as time when it comes to divorce, but also what, what led to it, what caused the rift, reportedly, was that um, Giselle was... Uh, didn't want Tom Brady to keep playing football, and uh, and he did. And she wanted to like focus on her. You know, she wanted to be the focus on on her and her career. And he keeps going with his career, and that's what led to the the rift. So you see, once again, it is it's kind of the difference in the sexes. Uh, yet another difference we're supposed supposed to pretend doesn't exist. Giselle wants Brady to be home with his family, but uh, from his point of view, he's supporting his family by working, and they don't need the money, of course. Like they could retire and live the 50 lifetimes on the money that he already has. And I'm sure that point was probably made to him by his wife. But um, even so, you know, that's just the way he sees it. He probably also imagines that he could be a better role model to his kids by working than by sitting at home. And at some level, these are excuses because he really wants to play football. But at another level, there's, there's plenty of truth to it. So the wife says, you need to be home more. You have a family. And the husband says, I know I have a family. That's why I'm out working. And Neither is wrong exactly, but their perspective and priorities don't match up. And unfortunately, on this case, in this case, though, so there are, you know, every married couple has disagreements like this in this vein. Um, but in this case, it's led to 
in ultimate calamity and catastrophe. Because it seems like they're both too focused on themselves, which is what always leads to divorce in, in the end, is a, is a focus on, on the self rather than on the vow and on the marriage. All right, let's get to the comment section. Who's bringing shopping cards back to the rightful place? We become insane. Here in the street we begin. Barry Sanchez says, I hope you played great music back in your shock jock days. What a freaking joke these people are. Don't worry, Matt. We have your back. Well, we didn't play great music. I unfortunately would tell you this is, uh, you know, early 2000s. The early 2000s rock scene was not was not great. It's kind of like a new rock. I don't know what the genre is ex- exactly. And so it was a lot. It's like Papa Roach type stuff is, is what it was. Not it wasn't my favorite. I, I'll admit to you. And we played Pearl Jam. Like Pearl Jam was at that point, you know, still older. It's like nine more nineties. We played Pearl Jam probably five times an hour. Um, Chris O'Neill says, Matt used to record himself and publish it to the world beardless. There is nothing that you can do to humiliate this man. Very good point. It doesn't get much worse than that. I, and really, I have, uh, it's been, ex- I've been exposed in, in a certain way as a fraud because, you know, now we see that the, the sweet baby gang mascot and symbol of me bearded as a, as a baby, you know, with a, with a beard as a baby. Now we see that that was not actually technically true. That has been revealed. Fit Theology says, Matt, after learning of your past escapades, I like you even more. Dix, Dixie Whiskey says, it warms the old bones seeing that Matt was a proto-troll before it was cool and has honed his craft over a long career. Take some time. It does take some time to grow into the, into the trolling. Anyway, there were a lot of comments like this, a lot of very supportive messages, which uh, I do really appreciate. Um, and it's like we talked about earlier in the show. You know, none of this works without support. That's, this is a thing about, you know, as we discussed yesterday, any cancellation attempt. It's like, here's, there are a couple of conditions that need to be met for a person to be canceled. The first is the one we talked about yesterday, which is that the, the canceled person needs to cooperate, needs to consent to it, needs to play the role that's been assigned to him, crawling on his knees, begging for forgiveness, only to not receive it anyway, and just to be kicked in the face and told to go away. Um, so that's the first thing that needs to happen for the cancellation. And the other thing that needs to happen is that the person needs to be isolated. So that's, this is this is always the, the game with the cancellation, is to isolate the person. You know, it's like a, a predator in the Serengeti, right? Like, find the sick, weak prey who's isolated from the herd and pounce on them. And so that is always the game. It's to make sure that you isolate this person, they have no support, and then you can take them out. Um, that's why if you have support, then you can't be canceled, which uh, which I know that I have, so I do appreciate that. But it's also a lesson for, for all of us. It's why we need to support each other when the left comes after us, because if we do, then... We're uh, unstoppable. There's my inspirational message. Well, the corporate media agenda means the news is presented in a biased way. You know it, I know it, we all know it. Thankfully, there's a way to get the most important news of the day without their narrative, and that's by listening to one of the top news podcasts, Morning Wire. New episodes are available every morning, seven days a week, and they cover stories other media outlets won't touch. It's starting this Sunday, October 9th, and every Sunday until the midterm elections. You can also tune in to Election Wire for in-depth coverage, candidate interviews, and more. It's the most important midterm election in recent history. Stay informed. You'll find Morning Wire and Election Wire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Daily Wire Plus, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. So one of my least favorite memes is the cartoon of the guy shushing another guy and saying, let people enjoy things. The, the let people enjoy things line is trotted out now on the internet approximately 46 million times a day. It's always deployed in reaction to anyone who uh, says something critical about a thing that other people enjoy. Um, and I hate the meme because first, it's lazy and unoriginal. And second, it implies that somehow you're preventing people from enjoying things simply by giving your own opinion about it which would seem to suggest that an individual's enjoyment of a thing is dependent on the encouragement of other individuals. 
If you need other people to encourage you in order to enjoy something, that would seem to suggest that perhaps there's a problem with whatever it is you're enjoying. Third, most importantly, the fact that people are enjoying something does not mean that it shouldn't that sh- that it should be exempt from criticism. All things in existence are enjoyed by somebody. Does that mean that nothing at all can ever be criticized? Serial killers enjoy murdering people. Can a serial killer give that response to the judge during trial? Uh, you've been convicted of 23 counts of murder in the first degree. Shh, judge, let people enjoy things, okay? The point is, it is valid to scrutinize the things people enjoy. In fact, we should especially scrutinize those things because it would seem often redundant to criticize that which nobody enjoys anyway. I say all this only to head off at the pass, the inevitable response to to today's daily cancellation, which focuses on the newly released adult Happy Meal. So CNBC reports, quote, you're never too old for a Happy Meal, or at least that's what McDonald's is banking on. The fast food juggernaut at uh, this week announced plans to introduce adult-oriented meals complete with a free toy in an initiative designed to work off of the nostalgia of the restaurant's famous red cardboard boxes. The Cactus Plant Flea Market box is a collaboration between McDonald's and the famous streetwear brand and will roll out to participating stores starting on October 3rd. Unlike the smaller menu items included in the classic Happy Meal, the Cactus Plant Flea Market box will feature either a Big Mac or a 10-piece Chicken McNuggets, as well as a soda and fries. Inside the box will be a will be one of four collectible figurines, collectible figurines of McDonald's mascots Grimace, the Hamburglar, and Birdie, as well as a Cactus Buddy. Quote, we're taking one of the most nostalgic McDonald's experiences and literally repackaging it in a new way that's hyper relevant for our adult fans. McDonald's chief marketing officer, Tariq Hassan, said in a statement. Well, they did just release their first ad for the adult Happy Meal. And uh, here it is. Hey, Cactus Buddy. Yeah, that's an ad that's supposed to appeal to adults. Not even just adults on acid, but sober adults too. And it seems to have worked, at least at first. Apparently, the adult Happy Meals are selling out all across the country. McDonald's workers have taken to TikTok, of course, uh, to complain about all of the extra work this promotion is forcing them to do because people are so into it. Adults are flocking to the fast food chain to order their very own nostalgic box. Uh, They're coming in such numbers that, as McDonald's employees report, it's creating chaos and stress for the staff. As for the customers, the initial excitement that these grown adults felt over their Happy Meals has apparently given way, though, to disappointment. And not disappointment in themselves for being so pathetic and emotionally stunted as to order a damned Happy Meal for themselves in the first place, but disappointment over the toys in the box. So Eat This reports, quote, On paper, the idea certainly sounds intriguing, but early reviews were quick to point out its shortcomings. Yes, this is not a nostalgic Happy Meal for adults. This is weird and artistic and appeals to teenagers, wrote one Reddit user after reading about the promotion. I was semi-interested as a fan of tacky, nostalgic knickknacks, but these don't capture the nostalgia, so that, so what's the point, added another Redditor. It's true, when most adults think back to their cherished childhood memories of Happy Meals, streetwear fashion doesn't immediately come to mind. Quote, there were so many directions McDonald's could have gone with the toys that would have felt special. Comic book toys, Nickelodeon toys, Ninja Turtle toys. These would have turned the millennia nostalgia up to 11, Jeremy Schneider of NJ.com opined, and it's hard not to agree with him. To be clear, that is an adult, a grown man, upset that his Happy Meal didn't come with a Ninja Turtle toy. What's next? Are you going to put on a Batman costume and go trick-or-treating and then cry to your mommy because you didn't get any fun dip in your plastic orange pumpkin? Actually, I don't even want to know the answer to that question. And see, this is the problem. The adult Happy Meal is yet another nostalgic brand promotion aimed squarely at millennials. And it works, at least initially, because millennials, my generation, as a group, absolutely refuse to grow the hell up. As a generation, we are growing older chronologically. We're experiencing all of the inevitable physical changes that come with that. We're getting fatter and slower. Our hair is thinning. We're developing chronic back pain, etc. But 
Emotionally and psychologically, we cling to the past, to our youth, to the things of childhood. 1 Corinthians says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. This is a verse that made sense to and, and resonated with most generations of humans who've lived on earth, but, but not with ours, because we never put away the childish things. We still speak and act and understand as children. And the result is that we are the most emotionally stunted generation of overgrown, pathetic babies that have ever lived on the face of the earth. Many of us have chosen not to have children of our own, instead electing to be children ourselves perpetually, ordering Happy Meals, watching cartoons, obsessed with superheroes and comic books, listening to music made for teenagers. Our tastes have not matured in the slightest because we have not matured in the slightest. And of course, I use the word we here only in a general sort of generational sense. There are maybe five or six of us who are exceptions to the rule. Now, two other points to consider. First, millennials are obsessed with nostalgia. You know, they eat anything up that reminds them of their childhoods. That's why any rebooted Nickelodeon show or film franchise from the 90s will attract intense interest from millennials. All of these Disney live-action remakes seem to target millennials even more than current-day children. Though the nostalgic millennial inevitably leaves these trips down memory lane feeling disappointed and unfulfilled. He sobs forlornly over his Happy Meal because it's not as delightful as he remembered it being in his childhood. He writes a scathing review of the latest Disney film because it didn't live up to his childhood memories. He sits in his beanbag chair drinking his Sunny D watching the Rugrats reboot. And yet he feels that it's somehow just not the same. And he's right. He was a child then and he isn't anymore. Even if he doesn't realize it, he has deeper spiritual and intellectual needs and desires today that simply aren't going to be satisfied by the distractions of his youth. Also, his nostalgic remembrances are only vaguely rooted in reality. Nostalgia is the story you tell yourself about your past, which is not the same thing as the actual past. And the most pitiful thing about it all, and the reason why he's never satisfied, no matter how much he immerses himself in nostalgia, is that all of his nostalgia is tied to brands. Millennials have a branded nostalgia. All that they pine for from childhood are corporate products and content. This makes it incredibly lucrative to exploit, but also means that our nostalgic pursuits will always feel empty in the end because they are. Here's the second and final point. There is a truly wholesome, joyful, fulfilling way to relive aspects of your childhood. And that is by having children yourself. Okay, I enjoy watching my children experience the sorts of things that I experienced in childhood. It can be very fun to go back and rediscover the joys of childhood by experiencing them with your child. So, for, for example, I actually have fun playing hide-and-seek or the floor is lava with my kids. That's a lot of fun. You know, last time I played that, I was like 10, and then my kids came of age. They got to floor is lava age, and uh, we could play with the kids. It's fun. I'm very competitive in both games, and I can become quite invested in them. But they're fun for me because my kids are having fun. It's something I can do with them. I wouldn't play it by myself. I wouldn't suggest it as a date night activity with my wife, except to annoy her. I'll also watch the sorts of things I watched as a kid with, with my kids. It can be fun to introduce them to the shows and films that I enjoyed when I was you know, their age. It can also be heartbreaking if they find it boring and lame, as happened uh, when I tried to get them to watch the original Space Jam, for example. The damned Philistines did not appreciate it at all. They were, they were bored out of their minds. I will also have the sorts of conversations with my kids that I used to have when I was a kid. So my son will say to me, hey, daddy, would you rather eat poop or get bit by a snake? And of course, I'll want to know, like, what sort of snake are we talking about and how much poop? I mean, if it's, if it's non-venomous, I'll probably take the snake. If it's a diamondback we're talking about, well, I, I guess I'm going with the poop. And we continue with the discussion for several minutes. Point being, there's a proper way to experience aspects of your own childhood again, and, and a way that will, will not only live up to your memories, but will often exceed them. Like, I feel like I can actually have more fun with some of these things now than I did as a kid because I'm with my own kids. I'll even eat Happy Meals. I will eat Happy Meals as an adult. 
but I eat them when I order them for my kids and I steal half of the meal before handing the box back to them in the car. Like a civilized and mature adult. Okay, that's the correct strategy. And that is why, ultimately, the adult Happy Meal is today canceled. And that'll do it for us today as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you on Monday. Godspeed.